So last time, <clears throat> um, we talked a bit about basic concept of electric flux and pretty much the only thing you really learned uh, that last time was that um, electric fields, you know, they go away from positive charges, they go toward negative charges, and we can speak of an electric field passing through an area as a way of talking about flux. If it passes out of a closed region overall, uh, we say that's due to a positive net charge, and if it goes in, that's due to an overall uh, negative charge. Okay, so what we want to do is develop these ideas a bit more. Okay, so I'm going to go over some basic concepts of flux. Uh, in this picture that you have here, um, we have uh, airflow, right? And so we could describe a volume of air passing through uh, a given area, you know, maybe like per second or something like that. And that would describe, that'd be a way to describe the flux of airflow. And uh, you can do this for like water traveling through a pipe. We do this for light, how much light passes through an area per second, something like that. Um, now, that area that we talk about will have a particular directional relationship to the quantity we're measuring. Like in the example here, our loop, the actual surface of the loop is perpendicular to the direction of flow. <clears throat> and so the most amount of air will pass through that particular loop. Um, in fact, the better way to characterize this is to talk about a normal vector you remember normal vectors back in 110, <clears throat> they were perpendicular, they're vectors that are perpendicular to surfaces. And so we're gonna talk about a normal vector here that is perpendicular to the loop, okay? And in this particular case here, the normal vector and the velocity vector of the air are parallel. And that would be the most amount of air that could pass through that area. On the other hand, if we took our area and we tilted it to the side like this, then the normal vector and the velocity flow are perpendicular to each other. And so at that point, no air goes through. If the air purely has horizontal components to it, then we would say that this has zero flux. If you had something that was intermediate, then there is a percentage of air that will go through there, which can be calculated when we break the velocity into components. So in the example here, our airflow is still horizontal, but now we've tilted our uh, area here so that the normal vector is at an angle with respect to the velocity vector. What we can do with that velocity vector is we can break it up into parallel and perpendicular components. The parallel component, well, this is this sounds parallel to the surface, I'll say that, but um, that would be perpendicular to the normal vector. Okay, there's two different perpendicular and parallel stuff here, so it's a little confusing, I'm sorry for that. But this other component that you see right, okay, where's the other thing? Right here, this thing there, ah, I'm trying to circle this. Oh my God, okay, don't do that. Do this. Okay, so that one there, that V perpendicular there, that runs along N. And so that's going to have the full amount of air going in that particular direction. Well, that's done with a cosine. If you take this vector here and we break it up into factors, uh, not factors, components, this up into components, and the, um, the component that we care about here. Um, is going to be, uh, well, yeah, it was going to be the cosine, cosine factor here that runs along there. So we have our flux as being VA cosine theta. Um, we are going to formally define our electric flux as being the product of the electric field times the area of the loop that we're considering times the cosine of the angle between the electric field and the normal vector. There's three parts to this flux, okay? 
And as you can probably see where we're going with this, this has all the right ingredients for a dot product. And sure enough, it is a dot product. Question for you here. We have a 100 Newton per Coulomb constant electric field passing through a two by two area. Great job. It is C. So you're simply, now in this example here, the normal vector and the electric field are parallel. So it's simply a product of your electric field times the area here. All right, I'm not, don't, 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 no, 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 no. This is pretty obvious. This is, this is so obvious, I don't even, I'm not even sure why I'm asking you this actually. But um, if you can't tell, and you probably can, because it's not the clearest picture in the world, that area, um, the area surface is, is, is uh, parallel to the, to the electric field. In other words, the normal vector is perpendicular to the, uh, to the electric field. And the answer is A, of course, yes. Uh-oh. This one here is a good one. We have uh, area. Okay, same area, but now we're going to put it at an angle. And I want you to tell me what that electric field, sorry, what that electric flux is going to be. So, <clears throat> this will be, um, you know, we could do like a battle royale physics, right? Everybody gets this right can stay. Everybody, everybody that gets it wrong, I'm going to kick them out of the Zoom session. And you got to be the last person at the end. That's fun, right? Drum roll. It's C. It's C. Now. There's a good reason why I gave you this question, because guess what most people mess up about electric flux? The angle. The angle. So, again, you... Uh, before... Um, well, no. So now what you know is uh, the normal vector, which is this vector right here, and the electric field. Okay, 20 degrees was listed here, but remember this, if this was flat, right, that's zero. So if we bring it up to 20 degrees, that's that's just, you know, 20 degrees above, you know, being completely horizontal here. So you gotta envision this vector. Just because you see an angle there, don't take that as gospel. Okay, all right, excellent. All right, so we want to actually make this into a dot product, okay? Back here, we want to make this a dot product. The problem with that is that dot products are between vectors. Electric field's a vector, so we have to cook up a way to make our area vector. Well, we can do that. The area vector will be defined as uh, the area in magnitude, okay, times a normal unit vector. Okay, so the n hat is a normal is a unit vector that is in the direction that is perpendicular to the surface. Okay, and so that can take on a lot of forms. It could be an i hat, it could be a j hat, it could be a combination of the two. Okay, but it has magnitude equal to a, and the direction is you know whatever the perpendicular direction is. So it's a little vague on purpose. It's meant to be a little bit vague, right? So vector a. We'll have units of meters squared, okay? So you gotta use meters here, as always, but still. Okay. So here is our dot product now, E dot A. That's our dot product. Um, few things about dot products. One, they are scalar quantities, right? This will have units of newtons, meters squared over coulombs, okay? And um, because we have now have a formal dot product definition, um, we can also do this in component form. Okay, so if you remember the way dot products look, this thing here in terms of magnitude and direction is E. Uh, well, why does it do that? E, A, cosine theta. That's one way to do this. 
I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. And then the other version, the component version, is now let's just say this has x and y components. It would be ex, the product of ex and, and ax, and the product of ey plus ay uh, times ay. So it's the product of ex and ax plus ey, ay. There'd be a plus ez, az if um, you had one of those. So, you know, that might be for a, a more complex surface, not a one-dimensional or two-dimensional surface. If it was a three-dimensional surface, you might have these. So for flex, we don't really do it in component form much, but there is technically two versions of it. Okay. So now, in the examples I've shown you so far, we were given a uniform electric field. And that's fine. Um, but if it's not uniform, then it's a little trickier to do. Uh, flux will add up over the entire surface. And the way we'd have to formally do that is with an integration. If the electric field doesn't have uh, a nice, well, it's, if it's not constant, basically. Okay. And so what we can do is we can cleverly select a bunch of different DAs on our surface and specify what the electric field is over all those locations and we perform a surface integral. Okay, surface integral is a fancy, it sounds fancy and it's not. It's just an integral over two dimensions is really all it is. Um, uh, by the way, just to be clear, if you didn't know, this, uh, this capital phi here is the Greek letter. That's being indicated. Okay. Now, <clears throat> good news is this. We are going to create problems that make this integral very easy to do. Very easy. And in fact, there is... Hmm, let me think about this. I'm not going to say that, actually. All right. <clears throat> so um, we have a curved surface here. Wait, why is this different? This is not different than this. This is not rel I don't understand this. Why this is even here? Why do I have this here? I said the same thing. Anyway, I don't know why this is here. All right. This is the good stuff. All right. <clears throat> oh, well. Oh, well, okay. So say we have this curved surface here, okay? If our electric field at every location on that surface is parallel to the surface, therefore perpendicular to the area vector, then the flux would be zero. So the surface is going to have to be have a smoothness to it that matches the field. And then at every point, your E dot DA will be zero. The other scenario is if you have a field that also matches a symmetry to the area. And in this case here, um, the electric field, while not constant, in general, is constant over the area that we're interested in. And so what that means is the electric field can come out of the, integr the integral because it is constant with respect to dA. And then this integral just becomes your standard expression for flux, which is E times A. That's it. When we do our problems, we are going to create surfaces so that we have a situation like this one here or this one here. Okay. This situation where we just have a standard surface with a non-uniform field and the electric field is different all along the surface, is something that could be done. You can do that. That's a little bit higher level stuff, not physics 120 stuff. So fortunately, you don't have to be an expert or know much about surface integrals because we're only going to have two scenarios every time. And that will basically the... Uh, the difficulty in doing these problems is trying to think up of surfaces that make the integrals nice to do. That's it.
that's it. So you'll see as we go through this. All right. Surfaces A and B have the same shape in the same area, which has the larger electric flux. The answer is A. Okay, so how do we know that? Well, we're looking at field lines, and the field line density is greater at A. The electric field is greater at A, and so even though they have, this, they have the same area, the electric field's larger at A, so it ends up having the same flux. They have the same areas, uh, but here they have a a is closer to the charge, therefore does a larger flux there. And in fact, you could, this wouldn't be too hard to calculate this flux because you can easily, <clears throat> you know, we know what the electric field is of a point charge. And, you know, for every point on the surface here, you could, you could work out an angle. So this is a doable integral. It's kind of a nice one, actually. It's not too hard to do. That's definitely this level of stuff. Hmm. How would you break that up, though? You probably break it up into, into rings. Yeah, you break it up. You break up this thing into rings, and then you integrate it. That should be a, that's a fun exercise. <clears throat> it's you, Walter. It's you. Well, actually, no, I don't know. I mean, it's not taller. Maybe a little wider. I don't know. Maybe he's a little wider. But I told you they had the same area, so it doesn't matter. I could have drawn it incorrectly. Sentences are going to trump pictures. Oh, my gosh, people. Focus on physics, not on the <clears throat> graphic design. All right. Which surface, A or B, will have the larger electric flux? We have a 100 Newton per Coulomb flux going in to this block-shaped region here, this uh, door, wait, door wedge, door like a door wedge, or like a piece of cheese, like a door wedge, actually. It's C. They have the same flux. Okay, so, now, mathematically, well... When I say they have the same flux, let me just specify one thing. And it wasn't really indicated in any of the options anyway, but they have the same magnitude, the same magnitude. The idea is that B has a cross-sectional area that matches A. Okay, so from the perspective of the field, it doesn't see that depth. It just sees two surfaces and they look identical to each other, okay? Um, whatever angle is here, you know, right? Whatever angle is right up here. Oh, come on. It's user error, I'm sure, but still. I'm... Okay, so that little angle right there, that angle is going to be used. Well, the complement of that angle, I should say, is going to be used to determine the flux through B. But guess what? The area of B times the cosine of that vector of uh, that angle between the normal vector and the electric field, guess what? That is equal to A. That's exactly what it is. They're the same. So the area of A is equal to cosine theta times area B, where that cosine is that angle between normal and... So now here's an easier way to explain it. Field lines enter A. Any field line that enters A will exit B. You can account for all of your field lines here. If every single line goes through one particular surface and comes out another side, then that is the same flux. Okay. In fact, we would actually say in this example here that the net flux is zero, actually, um, because there's going to be no flux on the bottom. I think I'm giving away my next problem here. Well, I'm, I'm doing a problem that's, that actually does this, so just I'll hold you in suspense till then. We want to calculate the electric flux through this surface here. Let's do it. All right. Oh, I already have it worked out here. Mm -hmm. All right. The electric flux is Ea cosine theta. E is 200 
newtons per coulomb. It is a uniform field. The area is a rectangle, 0.1 times 0.2. The cosine of uh, the angle that I'm going to use here is 30 degrees because 30 degrees is the angle between the electric field and the normal vector. The, vec the angle that was given in the problem was the angle between the electric field and the surface, but that's not what we use in the dot product. We use normal to electric field. Okay. So if we work all that out, uh, this the product of this is because this was radical three over two, and then you divide the two out, and then the hundred times the point zero one, you end up with two rad three, which is three point five newtons meters squared over coulombs. Okay. Any questions about that? Okie dokie. I think I have another example right away. <clears throat> I certainly do. All right. Ooh. Now we got component vectors here. This is nice. No. The normal force points wherever it points. I mean, I hate to be vague like that, but normal force points wherever it points. Um, if, it's, if it's at a tilt, you got to know, you'll be told something about that tilt in order to figure it out, you know, so. so yeah. <clears throat> but it's something that's very visual, okay? So you really need to see what's going on here. All right. So in this, we have a, you know, we have a, a two by three centimeter rectangle that lies in the XY plane. So it may look something like this. Of course. We still see example one. Ah, what? Come on, zoom. That is so ridiculous. Okay. So if I create a, it was hard to do this. If I create a three dimensional coordinate system. Oh, why did you? Am I pushing down to it? What causes that? I don't get it. Am I touching something accidentally here? I don't even know. Ah, oh, brother. Anyway, so it's it's in the XY plane here, so it may be something that looks kind of like this. And the field has components to it. Now, clearly, right, we're looking for what's perpendicular to the plane, right? So we only care about the Z components of things or K-hat stuff. So when you look at this, at these uh, electric field vectors, if like, for example, we look at B, that's an electric field that is in the XY plane, right? It's in the XY plane, so there should be no flux. If we look at A, we have an I hat and a K hat, okay? And the I hat, well, again, that's in the XY plane, so that's a zero. There will be something due to the 50, so let's work that one out. <coughs> No, I didn't, no, I didn't do that. Okay, so uh, first of all, let's work out my area. Uh, the area is 0 0.02 uh, times 0 0.03 K hat. So it's in the uh, X, Y plane here. Uh, sorry, it's in the uh, Z plane, right? And, um, and so that's gonna be six times 10 to the minus four um, meters squared. And, um, yeah, okay. So, um, I mentioned this before about the component version of doing a dot product involves the products of the X, Y, and Z components, you know, uh, added together. So, for B, we'll just do B first, the e uh the ax is zero and the ay is zero so those terms are zero and the electric field has no z component so every one of these terms is zero so overall there's no flux and again that makes sense because the surface and the field are parallel to each other right if i do part a well i got an ex but I don't have an AX, so that term's zero. 
I don't have any y components of anything, so that's zero. So you just have EZ times AZ, okay? And so EZ is 50 newtons per coulomb. That's the electric field strength right here, the 50, times what the area is. And those are parallel. There's no cosine to worry about because we're doing things in components. That's taken into account when you do your components here. And we end up with 0.03 newton meters squared over coulombs. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Um. Yeah. We are. Let me annotate this. When we have components, we want to work with this form of the electric flux. Okay. You can't see, Professor. What? You still want example two? Yeah. 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 I'm still talking about example two. Um. You guys can see this, what I'm doing? I just box this thing. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah, we're working with this version, not the EA cosine theta. If you have components, you don't, you don't have to do that. I mean, you could convert everything, but don't do not do that. Um, and then you're just basically working out. And we know what's going on with the A vector, right? I should put a little vector notation up here. But anyway, um, the, the A vector only has Z components. And so the first two terms automatically are zero. Doesn't matter what the problems are. The first two terms are zero because there's no AX, no AY. So you're literally looking at these and saying, okay, does the electric field have any Z component stuff? And if it does, then you take the product of the Z component and the area component. Okay, that's it. All right, let me see. Okay, new share. All right. Now, what we are going to be doing, okay, uh, when we use this method is we're going to be interested in closed integrals. So they're surface integrals over a closed surface. What that means is there is a volume that is bounded by the area. A volume is bounded by the area. So we're not going to be dealing with situations like over here, like this. This is not a closed surface. This is not a closed surface. That one's a closed surface here. The one with the little uh, door wedge thing. That's a closed surface. So we want closed surfaces here. And we're going to be very interested in what is inside these closed surfaces to produce these fluxes. Okay? So... Now, because we're dealing with closed surfaces, the convention that we're going to use here is you can talk about a normal, because like if I go back here, like this problem, I could have made the normal vector down, not up, right? The normal vector here, how, why is it up? It could, why, why can't it be down? Well, it could be down. I mean, I didn't make it down, but that kind of determines whether it's going to be a positive or negative flux. Because if this normal vector was down, well, then your cosine's negative. And you got a negative flux, right? So uh, the convention that we're going to use here is outside, out the surface. So toward the outside is our convention for our normal vector. It will always be on the outer surface, not an inner part, okay? So you imagine that it's like a shell, like imagine a sphere or something. Normal force is always going to point out, all right, so question for you now. Now we can start developing this a bit more. We have a cross-section of 3D closed surfaces. So these are like rectangular or triangular prisms. Imagine that, like a triangle or triangular prism. And uh, these are cross-sections of them. And um, these are the fields going through these things. Uh, which closed surface or surfaces have a zero flux? What do you think? Okay. A lot of people saying A. A is good. Okay, why? Well, let's look at the other ones. B has electric fields that come out of all the sides. So that is a overall positive electric flux. Okay, if we knew those areas, and this was like a uniform field, we could work it out. Right, but we don't have to do that here. C, everything goes in. 
So overall, a net negative electric flux. If you look at the one on, that's A, you got two field lines going in, two field lines going out. They appear to be parallel to the bottom. And so again, what I mentioned here previously was if every line goes into your closed surface and then exits at some point, then overall the net flux will be zero. Okay, so it's zero. All right, let's go ahead and calculate the electric flux through each side and then sum to find the net flux. These are closed surfaces, right? So you can take your closed integral and you can split it up into multiple integrals that correspond to each side of your closed surface. This is a cylinder, so our integral can be broken up into three integrals, okay? It's the left end, the right end, and the side. I'm calling, I'm calling the, the, that's the side. All right, so let's look at that. Okay, here we go. Now, so technically, this has, let me annotate this. Ah, uh, come on, Mr. Annotate. Work with me. Okay, so my close integral, E, dot da put some vectors on those is broken up into these three integrals it's kind of let me try to put up a a bigger line here uh, yeah i already did it okay so that here is going to be you would say the integral of say i don't know right side e dot da and then there's one for left, and there's one for, I'll just call it the side. Okay, that's supposed to be a plus. I didn't, I didn't write my arguments, but the arguments obviously go in there. It's the same as the stuff before though. So I broke it into three integrals here. Again, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like I'm back in uh, first grade here trying to learn how to write with this thing. So don't feel sorry for me, but you can, it's fine kind of looks like I'm in first grade, but <clears throat> anyway. So if we look at A here, <clears throat> I'm gonna break up these into three parts, left, right, wall, or I'm calling it wall, I guess, left, right, wall, okay? Now, in all these cases, the field is uniform. In all cases, the field's uniform, so it goes out of the integral, and then it's just the integral of the area, which is just the area, right? So for now, what you could see happening here is field lines enter the left side and they exit the right side. So if I were to work out the flux on the left, it would be a negative E pi r squared. And the right would be a positive E pi r squared. Every line that goes in the left comes out the right. And so overall that adds up to zero. And for the wall of the cylinder, um, the field is always perpendicular to a normal vector. So there's no flux through the wall at all. And that's true for both. The sum, is the, the sum is zero. So one statement we can make, and we talked a little bit about this last lecture, was if this is true, there is no net charge in the cylinder. Okay, no net charge in the cylinder. Uh, the reason why the, you have a negative here on the left is because a normal vector would point out like this and the electric field points in the opposite direction. So if you wanna, if you wanna talk about cosines or something, it'd be like cosine 180, basically. But anytime flux goes in field, sorry, anytime field goes into a surface, that will be negative. That will be negative. Now for the other one, um, instead of the field going in on the left, it comes out on the left. So as you can see, the lines are just coming out on either sides. So that is suggesting, I, I, using the word suggest is probably not even a fair word to use here. The, I don't even want to say the implication, there is a charge in there. That's a fact now. It's not, so the left is E pi r squared 
the right's e pi r squared, and still nothing through the wall. So if I add all this up, the sum, the flux is 2 e pi r squared. There is a positive net charge in there. We have no idea how it looks, um, although we can probably tell a little bit based on the field configuration, but um, it's, it's some positive charge. That's it. All right. Keep pushing through here. All right. So when we think of closed surfaces in the context of figuring out electric field stuff, we have a name for this and we call it a Gaussian surface. Gaussian surface just means closed surfaces specifically designed to look at um, you know, how electric fields and charges uh, to behave here. Um, it's a mathematical surface though, right? So the idea is that we just imagine creating these surfaces and that's really what the goal is going to be in a lot of the problems that we do. We have to be very clever and select Gaussian surfaces that help us do those integrals, okay? Last lecture, we talked a lot about symmetry. Your choice of your Gaussian surface has got to match charge symmetry, in some way that allows the integrals to be easy to do okay a lot of times you'll see cross sections like the one down here all right so a cylindrical symmetry uh would want you to use a cylindrical gaussian surface um because uh as in the example here you see in part a here you have field lines that are radially away. And at all points on the wall of that cylinder, the electric field vector uh, are parallel. Uh, through the top and the bottom, there is no flux because the field is parallel to those surfaces, perpendicular to normal vectors. So that is a useful type of symmetry to have. You could also rotate the surface on its side too we did that in the last example where things come out the ends and not the walls. Both configurations work fine. Um, your choice in which one you would use is just based on what makes your math easier, really. So this stuff here does require a little bit of creativity in knowing what to properly choose. Um, not, not entirely creative because if you choose something that's wrong, uh, and you go through the steps the way you're supposed to go through the steps, you're going to reach a part where you're, you're going to be like, well, I can't do this. This doesn't work. You know, the, the math is not easy now. So the way you know that you've made a correct choice in something is if you're performing the problem correctly after you select your Gaussian surface, if something doesn't appear to work out for you, then you got to go back and start again. So. All right. Now, you can create a lot of Gaussian surfaces. You can have ones that are very meaningless and ones that are too difficult. Again, you've got to pick something that matches your charge symmetry. Like the one here, there's clearly some kind of positive charge in the figure that's part A here. But the choice of that sphere, at least at its location, doesn't show a symmetric field. Okay, There appears to be more flux on the right side than on the left side. And so there's no simple way to perform an integral there, okay? Um, and then if you don't have a closed surface, it's, you know, Gauss's law is all about closed surfaces. So if you don't have a closed surface, then you're missing some part of Gauss's law then. So you got to make sure, again, um, and as I told you before, the choices are pretty clear. Uh, it's always spheres, cylinders, boxes. Is there anything other than that? I mean, I guess you could have other things, but we, for the most part, we do we do cylinders and boxes and, and, and spheres. And off the top of my head, I mean, nothing in this class that's very different from those things. All right. So let's just do the easy example that we can do. Let's try to think about what the electric flux is going to be due to a point charge, right? We're just going to start with the easy stuff, and then we're going to move up from there. All right, so <clears throat> a point charge has sphere tree, right? So what we can do is we can create a sphere that point 
electromagnetic charge. Okay, the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface, and on the surface, due to the inverse square law of uh, of spheres, uh, sorry, of the electric field, the electric field will have the same value at all points on the sphere. So it's an excellent Gaussian surf, uh, surface to use here because it makes our integral e dot dA very simple. The electric field is constant over the sphere, so the E comes out of the integration, and then you're just integrating over the, the closed area, which is just the surface area of a sphere. Surface area of a sphere is four pi radius squared. So, now we know what the electric field is of a point charge. We did that way back in the beginning of the class. It's Q, four pi epsilon out over R squared, well, check this out. Down here, your area is 4 pi radius squared, and you got a 4 pi radius squared down here that comes from the electric field. Those cancel out, and you're left with this expression, Q over epsilon naught. That's it. That's what the electric flux is. It depends on Q and this universe, epsilon naught. There's nothing in the electric flux that indicates what we used as a Gaussian surface. Okay, I we use the sphere because they made the math easy. But if you choose something else, say you choose a box, just a, a cube, put this thing in a cube and go do those painful integrations because the cube, the electric field is going to vary along the surface of the cube. It's doable because it's a very easy way to specify what the strength of the field is in a three-dimensional plane. But if you do all those crazy integrations, you're gonna end up with the same value, okay? So the idea here is we're trying to choose a Gaussian surface that makes this as easy as possible, okay? Trust me, I don't think, it, well, I don't know. Don't, if you have a lot of time in your hands, I suppose you can, but don't, don't have a lot of time in your hands. Do something better with your time, put it that way, all right. So, fantastic, all right. I just said this. All right. I, I just said this. Oh, well, the last thing, though, about that is, though, it doesn't depend on the, the doesn't depend on the Gaussian surface, which also means the flux is independent of R. It's independent of the value of R. Why? Well, guess what? Let's go back. This is a very powerful thing. In fact, this is at the core of all inverse square laws. OK. The field, right, the field drops as an R squared. But any sphere that you want to surround your point charge with is going to have an area that's proportional to R squared. So if I make my Gaussian sphere larger, therefore have more area, my field is conversely weaker. So they always cancel each other out. Okay, That's why this 4 pi exists. 4 pi R squared exists in the original statement Coulomb's law because of this fact here. Okay, the four pi epsilon naught comes about really through Gauss's law. And that's why we use the four pi epsilon naught here. If we didn't have the four pi epsilon naught, if you stuck with K, then we have like a K and a four and a pi, and it just, it looks more elegant like this. So, and then this E naught, by the way, is gonna be related to the speed of light at the end of the class. So there's some usefulness. There's more usefulness for the epsilon naught. The K stuff is, that's kitty stuff. Let's, that's, that's, we're not doing that anymore. I might do a little more. But that's the baby physics. This, this is the grown-up physics where we do epsilon naught. Okay. All right. Now, so <clears throat> what if I chose a different shape, though? I mean, I mentioned the cube, right? That's not as easy to visualize. Say I choose this oval looking thing here. I hate ovals, despise them. So, but we're gonna do an oval here. What you can do is you can look at this integral expression and realize that you can make your DAs as small as you like. Well, what you do is you start to divide up your Gaussian surface here. If you wanna really consider how to calculate this integral, you can basically subdivide this up 
so that your infinitesimal pieces are either radial or perpendicular. So you can always break this up down to finer and finer pieces. And ultimately, what you're going to find is all of the perpendicular pieces are zero. And if you add up the area of all the parallel pieces or all the pieces that are, you know, uh, aligned with the normal vector, um, then they will add up to a sphere. So this is really about cross section. I mean, when the, when the charge looks out, it sees a spherical region around it. You know, the charge doesn't see depth. Okay. Depth happens when you apply a test charge. You know, like that, so. Okay. Now we can do this with a group of charges. Okay, it doesn't have to be one charge. It could be a bunch of charges. And you can do what I explained here for any number of charges. And what you will find is that the more charges you add, the more flux you get equal to the same quantity. It's this Q over epsilon naught. And so every single charge has a Q over epsilon naught that goes with it. And the negatives do matter here because the negatives determine the direction of the electric field, which will determine if the flux is positive or negative. These positive charges inside here, okay, they're producing positive flux. There are field lines going away, right? Going away. So out of here. For these negative charges, they have flux coming in. So they're producing negative flux, right? What about these things that are out here? Out here, there's no contribution to flux because watch, if I have a, a single vector, no, you, you pen. So this, so if I have a field, I'm getting a little perturbed. So if I have a field line, you could see if for a charge that's outside, any field line that enters will exit. So there's no flux to that charge. <clears throat> so ultimately, if you have a group of charges, your electric flux is simply this statement down here. It's Q enclosed. You add up all the charges that are inside. <clears throat> you know, algebraically add them up, like positives and negatives, things like that. Right? All right. So this is it. This is Gauss's law. The Gauss's law is two separate statements that express the electric flux of something. One way of calculating electric flux is to look at a Gaussian surface. Okay. Look at a Gaussian surface and imagine how the electric field passes through the Gaussian surface you, you figure out and you work out a, 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 you know, an expression for that. The other side of it wants you to take a look at that closed surface and decide how much charge is enclosed in that surface you created, okay? What's a little tricky about this is at no point are you actually calculating flux though. That's not what you're doing. Here's what you're doing. This is used to calculate electric fields. You create a clever um, Gaussian surface that allows you to pull this electric field out of the integral expression. It comes out you work out a bunch of areas, you divide by that stuff, and you have your expression for the electric field. Okay, so there's two parts to Gauss's law. Creating the closed surface and figuring out how the electric field goes through it. And then separately, there is, you look at that closed surface that you made and you figure out how much charge is inside there. And it doesn't matter if it's point charges or continuous charges, because remember, any continuous charge can be broke up into individual point charges. So that you, you can, you can, you, so it's still a Q enclosed kind of thing. So now calculating Q enclosed can be kind of tricky though, especially if you have continuous distributions. We're going to have to invoke that stuff from before the lambda linear charge density or the sigma surface charge density or rho, which is volume charge density and so on. All right. So question for you here. Which spherical Gaussian surface has the larger electric flux? Is B. Okay. Why? More 
charge and close. There's two ways we can figure out flux. We can do the integral, which you shouldn't do here because it's going to take you a while to do it. Not that long, but. Uh, or just figure out Q and close. Q and close is 2Q. So what's the flux here? It's 2Q over epsilon naught. Bam, that's the flux. 2Q over epsilon naught is the flux. The answer is B. Okay, the surface, B has a bigger surface. So what? Flux does not, the ultimately, the value of the flux, as you can see from our Gauss's law expression, right? Ultimately, the flux doesn't depend on the Gaussian surface. Now, you need it to calculate it, but once you're all done calculating it, there's going to be nothing in here that really tells you anything about your Gaussian surface. <clears throat> and we can see that because it's on here on the right-hand side. It's just about what charge is in there. That's literally it. Q enclosed. If it's 2Q enclosed, it's 2Q over epsilon naught. Problem done. Move on. We have two Gaussian surfaces here of equal radius. Equal radius. All right. Which Gaussian surface has the larger electric flux? What has the larger electric flux? Uh oh. Somebody sent me an email from an AOL account. They still have those things? My goodness, you gotta move on. At some point, at what point do you move on? All right, the answer here is, well, let's see what you had to say first. No, their email still works, I think. No, actually, um, no, I don't think AOL will shut down, actually. I think they're literally still around. You can, you can like sign up for a service, you can go in and you can look at all the same stuff. It looks fancy now because it's, you know, not 1990, whatever, but, um, yeah. Oh, I have some stories of AOL back in the day. That was a dark place, I'll just say that. Okay. They have the same electric flux. Why? Because the Q enclosed is the same. Now you say, well, professor, they don't look the same. This Q down here has had a big lunch, and the other one is still hungry. Doesn't matter, okay? The size of the Q is not important. It's Q enclosed. It doesn't matter where it is. Hey, this Q up here, you can pull that Q over to the side here. Let's put it over here. We don't even have to put it in the middle. Because what is the flux? It's Q enclosed. It doesn't matter how it's uh, configured or how big it is or small it is. It's just... If you know the amount of flux, if you know the amount of charge, that's all you need to know. Now, we won't always know that, though. That's where it gets a little tricky. Okay. So, uh, I said all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, I already said all this. All right. So, I think I got... Oh! <clears throat> all right. Find the electric flux through each surface. All right. Nice. So, what you got to do, really, in these problems here is you got to work out what Q enclosed is. We got a 3Q minus 2Q. Three positive charges, two negative charges. So the electric flux for this one right here, uh-oh, is going to be Q over epsilon naught because that is the net charge. Right, over here. Q enclosed is Q minus 2Q. We don't, these ones are outside, right? It's not Q out closed, it's enclosed. So our electric flux is minus Q over epsilon naught because there's a net, I gotta figure this little dash word that, I don't know what's going on there with that. And then what about C? What about C? Well, C, Q enclosed for C, is zero. The flux is zero over epsilon naught. But it's just zero, right? Okay. That's it? Is that, is that easy? You like that? Well, I'll make it hard. Don't worry. Every time you think something's easy, if you think it's easy, that's not okay. That's not okay. I'm not going to rob you of the bliss that you will earn.
when you learn this physics. Gaussian surface surrounds an electric dipole. The net enclosed charge is zero. What is true? This is a good question. I'm going to give you a good minute to think about this one. Think, I'll, 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 never mind. Maybe, I, maybe you know what you're talking about. The answer is B. Okay, the answer is B. I hope that's because you're learning something here, but it could be because I accidentally clicked it. <clears throat> so there's a big difference between saying flux is zero and field is zero. There is no net flux, right? But is there a field? Yeah. Yeah. There's no net flux, but is there a field? Yes, there is. So if there's no net flux, is Gauss's law going to be helpful to solve this, this problem to figure out the electric field? No, it won't be. It won't be a good idea to do that. Unless I pick some other thing, which I don't even know what that would be. You can't use, as far as I'm aware, there's no, there's no nice, elegant way to use Gauss's law for dipoles. There's a nasty way, which I'm not going to tell you about, but, but I cannot emphasize this more. If the flux is zero, it doesn't mean the field is zero, okay? It, that, all that means is there is as many lines leaving the surface as entering the surface. That's what that means, <clears throat> okay? But it's a very common mistake, very common mistake, okay? And that people see that flux is zero, and actually a couple of things happen. When somebody says that flux is zero, sometimes they make this, oh, well, the electric field is zero. No, that's wrong. Also, they see the flux is zero, and they say, oh, well, there's, there's no charge inside. That's not true either. There's no net charge, right? There's no net charge. I mean, it's possible there's no charge, but having flux be zero means there's no net charge. Okay, so this is a very common mistake that people get. So my advice to you is to not make this mistake. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> All right. Think about this for a moment. We got this in another example, and then we're done. Good on time. Think about this for a bit. All right, let's see what we got here. I'm excited to see a lot of C's, a lot of C's. Yes, indeed. What's going on here? Well, if we look, we have two surfaces here. Surface one only contains one charge. If the flux is 2Q, well, we know that Q1 is Q2. Okay, so B is wrong. Then we look at the weird ellipse thing that we have there, and it has two charges enclosed. Well, we know one is 2Q. The net charge is Q, so there has to be a negative charge in there, a negative Q. Because 2Q minus Q, that gives you a Q overall, and that tells us what the flux is here. Fantastic. Last example. Uh, let me just show it here. Okay, <clears throat> so you got a little, uh, you got a little puzzle here, kind of. We have three cross-sectional Gaussian surfaces. And each one contains at least two charges in it. And you're told what the flux is through those, and you have to sort of uh, decipher, you know, what's going on here. What you can do is, uh, I mean, you know, you can create a system of equations. And I hate to say that. But, I mean, obviously for, let's see, if we look at A here, A has Q1 and Q3. If you add those up, it apparently equals negative Q. Okay, what about B? B is the one that's uh, almost horizontal. It has Q1 and Q2 in it. So we add up Q1 and Q2, and apparently that's equal to 3Q. And then the other one is, uh, two plus, uh, is Q2 plus Q3. That's this one over here. And apparently it adds up to negative 2Q. And you just got to solve this system. Okay. <clears throat> and there's there's three ways to do that, right? One is you just guess, right? These are just integers, right? Just guess. Just pick a bunch of things. And, you, you know, you will get it right eventually. Or you just solve the system by normal algebraic means, 
which, you know, elimination, substitution, all that good stuff here, right? Because, like, what, what would you do here? Looks like, uh, you know, well, whatever. You know how to do that stuff. <clears throat> the other way is to be a total nerd and do linear algebra, right? Make it into a matrix and actually get something out of your linear algebra class for once, you know? I probably – actually, I, I, call, I don't want to call you a nerd for that um, <clears throat> because I want you to encourage – I want to encourage you to do something that will make that linear algebra course feel valuable in some way. And even after you do this, you probably won't feel that way, but still. <clears throat> Just do substitution method here, right? I mean like what? Okay, subtract these two, right? Subtract them. You know, if you subtract them, then you can – uh, then you got two equations, solve for Q1, get two, two. But anyway, if you do solve this system here, oh, I get, actually, I, I guess you did it down here, right? Uh, B minus C gives you this equation here. Uh, we put that into A, and we get a, a Q1 is a 2, and then a 1 and negative 3. Well, that's how that system solved. Fantastic. All right. So...